Section 6 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Elston. Section 6 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 1, The Corpus Delecti, Part 2, by Melville Davison Post, 1869-1930. through 1930. The place which Samuel Walcott had selected for the residence of Nina San Croix was far up in the northern suburb of New York. The place was very old. The lawn was large and ill-kept. The house, a square old-fashioned brick, was set far back from the street, and partly hidden by trees. Around it all was a rusty iron fence. The place had the air of genteel ruin such as one finds in the virginias on a thursday of november about three o'clock in the afternoon a little man driving a dray stopped in the alley at the rear of the house as he opened the back gate an old negro woman came down the steps from the kitchen and demanded to know what he wanted the drayman asked if the lady of the house was in the old negro answered that she was asleep at this hour and could not be seen that is good said the little man now there won't be any row i brought up some cases of wine which she ordered from our house last week and which the boss told me to deliver at once but i forgot it until to-day just let me put it in the cellar now auntie and don't say a word to the lady about it and she won't ever know that it was not brought up on time the drayman stopped fished a silver dollar out of his pocket and gave it to the old negro there now auntie he said my job depends upon the lady not knowing about this wine keep it mum that's all right honey said the old servant beaming like a may morning the cellar door is open carry it all in and put it in the back part and nobody ain't never gonna know how long it has been in dar the old negro went back into the kitchen and the little man began to unload the dray he carried in five wine cases and stowed them away in the back part of the cellar as the old woman had directed then after having satisfied himself that no one was watching he took from the dray two heavy paper sacks presumably filled with flour and a little bundle wrapped in an old newspaper these he carefully hid behind the wine cases in the cellar after a while he closed the door climbed on his dray and drove off down the alley about eight o'clock in the evening of the same day a mexican sailor dodged in the front gate and slipped down to the side of the house he stopped by the window and tapped on it with his finger in a moment a woman opened the door she was tall lithe and splendidly proportioned with a dark spanish face and straight hair the man stepped inside the woman bolted the door and turned round ah she said smiling is it you senor how good of you the man started whom else did you expect he said quickly oh laughed the woman perhaps the archbishop nina said the man in a broken voice that expressed love humility and reproach his face was white under the black sunburn for a moment the woman wavered a shadow flitted over her eyes and then she stepped back no she said not yet the man walked across to the fire sank down in a chair and covered his face with his hands the woman stepped up noiselessly behind him and leaned over the chair the man was either in great agony or else he was a superb actor for the muscles of his neck twitched violently and his shoulders trembled oh he muttered as though echoing his thoughts i can't do it i can't the woman caught the words and leaped up as though someone had struck her in the face she threw back her head her nostrils dilated and her eyes flashed you can't do it she cried then you do love her you shall do it do you hear me you shall do it you killed him you got rid of him but you shall not get rid of me i have the evidence all of it the archbishop will have it to-morrow they shall hang you do you hear me they shall hang you the woman's voice rose it was loud and shrill the man turned slowly round without looking up stretched out his arms toward the woman she stopped and looked down at him the fire glittered for a moment and then died out of her eyes her bosom heaved and her lips began to tremble with a cry she flung herself into his arms caught him around the neck and pressed his face up close against her cheek oh dick 
Dick, she sobbed, I do love you so. I can't live without you. Not another hour, Dick. I do want you so much, so much, Dick. The man shifted his right arm quickly, slipped a great Mexican knife out of his sleeve, and passed his fingers slowly up the woman's side until he felt the heart beat under his hand. Then he raised the knife gripped the handle tight, and drove the keen blade into the woman's bosom. The hot blood gushed out over his arm and down on his leg. The body, warm and limp, slipped down in his arms. The man got up, pulled out the knife, and thrust it into a sheath at his belt, unbuttoned the dress, and slipped it off of the body. As he did this, a bundle of papers dropped upon the floor. These he glanced at hastily, and put into his pocket. Then he took the dead woman up in his arms, went out into the hall, and started to go up the stairway. The body was relaxed and heavy, and for that reason difficult to carry. He doubled it up into an awful heap with the knees against the chin, and walked slowly and heavily up the stairs and out into the bathroom. There he laid the corpse down on the tiled floor. Then he opened the window, closed the shutters, and lighted the gas. The bathroom was small and contained an ordinary steel tub, porcelain lined, standing near the window and raised about six inches above the floor. The sailor went over to the tub, pried up the metal rim of the outlet with his knife, removed it, and fitted into its place a porcelain disc, which he took from his pocket. To this disc was attached a long platinum wire, the end of which he fastened on the outside of the tub. After he had done this, he went back to the body, stripped off its clothing, put it down in the tub, and began to dismember it with a great Mexican knife. The blade was strong and sharp as a razor. The man worked rapidly and with the greatest care. When he had finally cut the body into as small pieces as possible, he replaced the knife in its sheath, washed his hands, and went out of the bathroom and downstairs to the lower hall. The sailor seemed perfectly familiar with the house. By a side door, he passed into the cellar. There he lighted the gas, opened one of the wine cases, and taking up all the bottles that he could conveniently carry, returned to the bathroom. There he poured the contents into the tub on the dismembered body, and then returned to the cellar with the empty bottles, which he replaced in the wine cases. This he continued to do until all the cases but one were emptied and the bathtub was more than half full of liquid. This liquid was sulfuric acid. When the sailor returned to the cellar with the last empty wine bottles, he opened the fifth case, which really contained wine, took some out of it, and poured a little into each of the empty bottles in order to remove any possible odor of the sulfuric acid. Then he turned out the gas and brought up to the bathroom with him the two paper flour sacks and the little heavy bundle. These sacks were filled with nitrate of soda. He set them down by the door, opened the little bundle, and took out two long rubber tubes, each attached to a heavy gas burner, not unlike the ordinary burners of a small gas stove. He fastened the tubes to two of the gas jets, put the burners under the tub, turned the gas on full, and lighted it. Then he threw into the tub the woman's clothing and the papers which he had found on her body, after which he took up the two heavy sacks of nitrate of soda and dropped them carefully into the sulfuric acid. When he had done this, he went quickly out of the bathroom and closed the door. The deadly acids at once attacked the body and began to destroy it. As the heat increased, the acids boiled, and the destructive process was rapid and awful. From time to time the sailor opened the door of the bathroom cautiously, and holding a wet towel over his mouth and nose, looked in at his horrible work. At the end of a few hours there was only a swimming mass in the tub. When the man looked at four o'clock it was all a thick, murky liquid. He turned off the gas quickly and stepped back out of the room. For perhaps half an hour he waited in the hall. Finally, when the acids had cooled so that they no longer gave off fumes, he opened the door and went in, took hold of the platinum wire, and pulling the porcelain disc from the stopcock, allowed the awful contents of the tub to run out. Then he turned on the hot water, rinsed the tub clean, and replaced the metal outlet. 
Removing the rubber tubes, he cut them into pieces, broke the porcelain disc, and rolling up the platinum wire, washed it all down the sewer pipe. The fumes had escaped through the open window. This he now closed and set himself to putting the bathroom in order, and efficiently removing every trace of his night's work. The sailor moved around with the very greatest degree of care. Finally, when he had arranged everything to his complete satisfaction, he picked up the two burners, turned out the gas, and left the bathroom, closing the door after him. From the bathroom he went directly to the attic, concealed the two rusty burners under a heap of rubbish, and then walked carefully and noiselessly down the stairs and through the lower hall. As he opened the door and stepped into the room where he had killed the woman, two police officers sprang out and seized him. The man screamed like a wild beast taken in a trap, and sank down. "'Oh! Oh!' he cried. "'It was no use! It was no use to do it!' Then he recovered himself in a manner, and was silent. The officers handcuffed him, summoned the patrol, and took him at once to the station-house. There he said he was a Mexican sailor, and that his name was Victor Ancona, but he would say nothing further. The following morning he sent for Randolph Mason, and the two were long together. The obscure defendant charged with murder has little reason to complain of the law's delays. The morning following the arrest of Victor Ancona, the newspapers published long sensational articles, denounced him as a fiend, and convicted him. The grand jury, as it happened, was in session. The preliminaries were soon arranged, and the case was railroaded into trial. The indictment contained a great many counts, and charged by the prisoner with the murder of Nina San Croix by striking, stabbing, choking, poisoning, and so forth. The trial had continued for three days, and had appeared so overwhelmingly one-sided that the spectators who were crowded in the courtroom had grown to be violent and bitter partisans to such an extent that the police watched them closely. The attorneys for the people were dramatic and denunciatory, and forced their case with arrogant confidence. Mason, as counsel for the prisoner, was indifferent and listless. Throughout the entire trial he had sat almost motionless at the table, his gaunt form bent over, his long legs drawn up under his chair, and his weary, heavy-muscled face, with its restless eyes, fixed and staring out over the heads of the jury, was like a tragic mask. The bar, and even the judge, believed that the prisoner's counsel had abandoned the case. The evidence was all in, and the people rested. It had been shown that Nina San Croix had resided for many years in the house in which the prisoner was arrested, that she had lived by herself with no other companion than an old negro servant, that her past was unknown, and that she received no visitors save the Mexican sailor who came to her house at long intervals. Nothing whatever was shown tending to explain who the prisoner was, or whence he had come. It was shown that on Tuesday preceding the killing, the Archbishop had received a communication from Nina San Croix, in which she said she desired to make a statement of the greatest import, and asking for an audience. To this the Archbishop replied that he would willingly grant her a hearing if she would come to him at eleven o'clock on Friday morning. Two policemen testified that about eight o'clock on the night of Thursday they had noticed the prisoner slip into the gate of Nina San Croix's residence and go down to the side of the house where he was admitted, that his appearance and seeming haste had attracted their attention, that they had concluded that it was some clandestine amour, and, out of courtesy, had both slipped down to the house and endeavored to find a position from which they could see into the room, but were unable to do so, and were about to go back to the street, when they heard a woman's voice cry out in great anger, "'I know that you love her and that you want to get rid of me, but you shall not do it. You murdered him, but you shall not murder me. I have all the evidence to convict you of murdering him. The archbishop will have it to-morrow. They shall hang you. Do you hear me? They shall hang you for this murder.' That thereupon one of the policemen proposed that they should break into the house and see what was wrong. But the other had urged that it was only the usual lover's quarrel, and if they should interfere they would find nothing upon which a charge could be based, and would only be laughed at by the chief, 
that they had waited and listened for a time, but hearing nothing further, had gone back to the street and contented themselves with keeping a strict watch on the house. The people proved further that on Thursday evening Nina San Croix had given the old negro domestic a sum of money and dismissed her with the instruction that she was not to return until sent for. The old woman testified that she had gone directly to the house of her son and later had discovered that she had forgotten some articles of clothing which she needed, that thereupon she had returned to the house and had gone up the back way to her room. This was about eight o'clock that while there she had heard Nina St. Croix's voice in great passion, and remembered that she had used the words stated by the policeman, that these sudden, violent cries had frightened her greatly, and she had bolted the door and been afraid to leave the room. Shortly thereafter she had heard heavy footsteps ascending the stairs, slowly and with great difficulty, as though some one were carrying a heavy burden that therefore her fear had increased, and that she had put out the light and hidden under the bed. She remembered hearing the footsteps moving about upstairs for many hours, how long she could not tell. Finally, about half-past four in the morning, she crept out, opened the door, slipped downstairs, and ran out into the street. There she had found the policemen, and requested them to search the house. The two officers had gone to the house with the woman. She had opened the door, and they had just time to step back into the shadow when the prisoner entered. When arrested, Victor Ancona had screamed with terror and cried out, It was no use! It was no use to do it! The chief of police had come to the house and instituted a careful search. In the room below, from which the cries had come, he found a dress which was identified as belonging to Nina St. Croix, and which she was wearing when last seen by the domestic, about six o'clock that evening. This dress was covered with blood, and had a slit about two inches long in the left side of the bosom, into which the Mexican knife found on the prisoner fitted perfectly. These articles were introduced in evidence, and it was shown that the slit would be exactly over the heart of the wearer, and that such a wound would certainly result in death. There was much blood on one of the chairs and on the floor. There was also blood on the prisoner's coat and the leg of his trousers, and the heavy Mexican knife was also bloody. The blood was shown by the experts to be human blood. The body of the woman was not found, and the most rigid and tireless search failed to develop the slightest trace of the corpse, or the manner of its disposal. The body of the woman had disappeared as completely as though it had vanished into the air. When counsel announced that he had closed for the people, the judge turned and looked gravely down at Mason. Sir, he said, the evidence for the defense may now be introduced. Randolph Mason arose slowly and faced the judge. If your honor please, he said, speaking slowly and distinctly, the defendant has no evidence to offer. He paused while a murmur of astonishment ran over the courtroom. But if your honor please, he continued, I move that the jury be directed to find the prisoner not guilty. The crowd stirred. The counsel for the people smiled. The judge looked sharply at the speaker over his glasses. On what ground? he said curtly. On the ground, replied Mason, that the corpus delecti has not been proven. Ah! Oh, said the judge, for once losing his judicial gravity. Mason sat down abruptly. The senior counsel for the prosecution was on his feet in a moment. What? he said. The gentleman bases his motion on a failure to establish the corpus delecti? Does he jest, or has he forgotten the evidence? The term corpus delecti is technical and means the body of the crime, or the substantial fact that a crime has been committed. Does any one doubt it in this case? It is true that no one actually saw the prisoner kill the decedent, and that he has so successfully hidden the body that it has not been found, but the powerful chain of circumstances, clear and close-linked, proving motive, the criminal agency and the criminal act is overwhelming. 
the victim in this case is on the eve of making a statement that would prove fatal to the prisoner. The night before the statement is to be made, he goes to her residence. They quarrel. Her voice is heard raised high in the greatest passion, denouncing him and charging that he is a murderer, that she has the evidence and will reveal it, that he shall be hanged, and that he shall not be rid of her. Here is the motive for the crime clear as light. Are not the bloody knife, the bloody dress, the bloody clothes of the prisoner unimpeachable witness to the criminal act? The criminal agency of the prisoner has not the shadow of a possibility to obscure it. His motive is gigantic. The blood on him and his despair when arrested cry murder, murder, with a thousand tongues. Men may lie, but circumstances cannot. The thousand hopes and fears and passions of men may delude or bias the witness. Yet it is beyond the human mind to conceive that a clear, complete chain of concatenated circumstances can be in error. Hence it is that the greatest jurists have declared that such evidence, being rarely liable to delusion or fraud, is safest and most powerful. The machinery of human justice cannot guard against the remote and improbable doubt. The inference is persistent in the affairs of men. It is the only means by which the human mind reaches truth. If you forbid the jury to exercise it, you bid them work after first striking off their hands. Rule out the irresistible inference, and the end of justice is come in this land, and you may as well leave the spider to weave his web through the abandoned courtroom. The attorney stopped, looked down at Mason with a pompous sneer, and retired to his place at the table. The judge sat thoughtful and motionless. The jurymen leaned forward in their seats. "'If your honor please,' said Mason, rising, "'this is a matter of law, plain, clear, and so well settled in the state of New York that even counsel for the people should know it. The question before your honor is simple. If the corpus delecti, the body of the crime, has been proven as required by the laws of the Commonwealth, then this case should go to the jury. If not, then it is the duty of this court to direct the jury to find the prisoner not guilty. There is here no room for judicial discretion. Your Honor has but to recall and apply the rigid rule announced by our courts prescribing distinctly how the corpus delecti in murder must be proven. The prisoner here stands charged with the highest crime. The law demands first that the crime, as a fact, be established. The fact that the victim is indeed dead must first be made certain before anyone can be convicted for her killing, because, so long as there remains the remotest doubt as to the death, there can be no certainty as to the criminal agent, although the circumstantial evidence indicating the guilt of the accused may be positive, complete, and utterly irresistible. In murder, the corpus delecti, or body of the crime, is composed of two elements, death as a result the criminal agency of another as the means. It is the fixed and immutable law of this state laid down in the leading case of Ruloff versus the people, and binding upon this court, that both components of the corpus delecti shall not be established by circumstantial evidence. There must be direct proof of one or the other of these two component elements of the corpus delecti. If one is proven by direct evidence, the other may be presumed, but both shall not be presumed from circumstances, no matter how powerful, how cogent, or how completely overwhelming the circumstances may be. In other words, no man can be convicted of murder in the state of New York unless the body of the victim be found and identified, or there be direct proof that the prisoner did some act adequate to produce death and did it in such a manner as to account for the disappearance of the body. The face of the judge cleared and grew hard. Members of the bar were attentive and alert. They were beginning to see the legal escape open up. The audience were puzzled. They did not yet understand. Mason turned to the counsel for the people. His ugly face was bitter with contempt. For three days, he said, I have been tortured by this useless and expensive farce. If counsel for the people had been other than play-actors, 
they would have known in the beginning that Victor Ancona could not be convicted for murder unless he were confronted in this courtroom with a living witness who had looked into the dead face of Nina San Croix, or, if not that, a living witness who had seen him drive the dagger into her bosom. I care not if the circumstantial evidence in this case were so strong and irresistible as to be overpowering, if the judge on the bench, if the jury, if every man within the sound of my voice were convinced of the guilt of the prisoner, to the degree of certainty that is absolute, if the circumstantial evidence left in the mind no shadow of the remotest improbable doubt, yet in the absence of the eyewitness, this prisoner cannot be punished, and this court must compel the jury to acquit him. The audience now understood, and they were dumbfounded. Surely this was not the law. They had been taught that the law was common sense, and this, this was anything else. Mason saw it all and grinned. In its tenderness, he sneered, the law shields the innocent. The good law of New York reaches out its hand and lifts the prisoner out of the clutches of the fierce jury that would hang him. Mason sat down. The room was silent. The jurymen looked at each other in amazement. The counsel for the people arose. His face was white with anger and incredulous. "'Your honor,' he said, this doctrine is monstrous. Can it be said that in order to evade punishment the murderer has only to hide or destroy the body of the victim, or sink it into the sea? Then if he is not seen to kill, the law is powerless, and the murderer can snap his finger in the face of retributive justice. If this is the law, then the law for the highest crime is a dead letter. The great commonwealth winks at murder and invites every man to kill his enemy, provided he kill him in secret and hide him. I repeat, your honor, the man's voice was now loud and angry and rang through the courtroom, that this doctrine is monstrous. So said Best, and Story, and many another, muttered Mason. And the law remained. The court, said the judge abruptly, desires no further argument. The counsel for the people resumed his seat. His face lighted up with triumph. The court was going to sustain him. The judge turned and looked down at the jury. He was grave and spoke with deliberate emphasis. "'Gentlemen of the jury,' he said, "'the rule of Lord Hale obtains in this state and is binding upon me. It is the law, as stated by counsel, for the prisoner, that to warrant conviction of murder there must be direct proof, either of the death, as of the finding and identification of the corpse, or of criminal violence adequate to produce death, and exerted in such a manner as to account for the disappearance of the body. And it is only when there is direct proof of the one that the other can be established by circumstantial evidence. This is the law, and cannot now be departed from. I do not presume to explain its wisdom. Chief Justice Johnson has observed in the leading case, that it may have its probable foundation in the idea that where direct proof is absent as to both the fact of the death and of the criminal violence capable of producing death, no evidence can rise to the degree of moral certainty that the individual is dead by criminal intervention, or even led by direct inference to this result, and that where the fact of death is not certainly ascertained, all inculpatory circumstantial evidence wants the key necessary for its satisfactory interpretation, and cannot be depended on to furnish more than probable results. It may be, also, that such a rule has some reference to the dangerous possibility that a general preconception of guilt or a general excitement of popular feeling may creep in to supply the place of evidence, if upon other than direct proof of death or a cause of death a jury are permitted to pronounce a prisoner guilty. 
In this case, the body has not been found, and there is no direct proof of criminal agency on the part of the prisoner, although the chain of circumstantial evidence is complete and irresistible in the highest degree. Nevertheless, it is all circumstantial evidence, and under the laws of New York, the prisoner cannot be punished. I have no right of discretion. The law does not permit a conviction in this case, although every one of us may be morally certain of the prisoner's guilt. I am, therefore, gentlemen of the jury, compelled to direct you to find the prisoner not guilty. Judge! interrupted the foreman, jumping up in the box. We cannot find that verdict under our oath. We know that this man is guilty. Sir, said the judge, this is a matter of law in which the wishes of the jury cannot be considered. The clerk will write a verdict of not guilty, which you, as foreman, will sign. The spectators broke out into a threatening murmur that began to grow and gather volume. The judge rapped on his desk and ordered the bailiffs promptly to suppress any demonstration on the part of the audience. Then he directed the foreman to sign the verdict prepared by the clerk. When this was done, he turned to Victor Ancona. His face was hard and there was a cold glitter in his eyes. "'Prisoner at the bar,' he said, "'you have been put to trial before this tribunal on a charge of cold-blooded and atrocious murder.' The evidence produced against you was of such powerful and overwhelming character that it seems to have left no doubt in the minds of the jury, nor indeed in the mind of any person present in this courtroom. Had the question of your guilt been submitted to these twelve arbiters, a conviction would certainly have resulted, and the death penalty would have been imposed. But the law, rigid, passionless, even-eyed, has thrust in between you and the wrath of your fellows and saved you from it. I do not cry out against the impotency of the law. It is perhaps as wise as imperfect humanity could make it. I deplore, rather, the genius of evil men who by cunning design are enabled to slip through the fingers of this law. I have no word of censure or admonition for you, Victor Ancona. The law of New York compels me to acquit you. I am only its mouthpiece, with my individual wishes throttled. I speak only those things which the law directs I shall speak. You are now at liberty to leave this courtroom, not guiltless of the crime of murder, perhaps, but at least rid of its punishment. The eyes of men may see Cain's mark on your brow, but the eyes of the law are blind to it. When the audience fully realized what the judge had said, they were amazed and silent. They knew as well as men could know that Victor Ancona was guilty of murder, and yet he was now going out of the courtroom free. Could it happen that the law protected only against the blundering rogue? They had heard always of the boasted completeness of the law, which magistrates from time immemorial had labored to perfect. And now, when the skillful villain sought to evade it, they saw how weak a thing it was. The wedding march of Lohengrin floated out from the Episcopal Church of St. Mark, clear and sweet, and perhaps heavy with its paradox of warning. The theatre of this coming contract before high heaven was a wilderness of roses worth the taxes of a county. The high caste of Manhattan, by the grace of the check-book, were present clothed in Parisian purple and fine linen, cunningly and marvelously wrought. Over in her private pew, ablaze with jewels and decked with fabrics from the deft hand of many a weaver, sat Mrs. Miriam Stuvesant, as imperious and self-complacent as a queen. To her it was all a kind of triumphal procession proclaiming her ability as a general. With her were a few of the genus homo, which obtains at the five o'clock teas, instituted, say the sages, for the purpose of sprinkling the holy water of Leth. Zarina, whispered Reggie du Puyster, leaning forward, I salute you. The ceremony, sub jugum, is superb. 
Walcott is an excellent fellow, answered Mrs. Duvisant. Not a vice, you know, Reggie. Ay, Empress, put in the others. A purist taken in the net, the clean-skirted one has come to the altar. Viva la virtu! Samuel Walcott, still sunburned from his cruise, stood before the chancel with the only daughter of the blue-blooded St. Clair's. His face was clear and honest, and his voice firm. This was life and not romance. The lid of the sepulchre had closed, and he had slipped from under it. And now and ever after the hand, red with murder, was clean as any. The minister raised his voice, proclaiming the holy union before God, and this twain, half pure, half foul, now by divine ordinance one flesh, bowed down before it. No blood cried from the ground. The sunlight of high noon streamed down through the window panes like a benediction. Back in the pew of Mrs. Miriam Stuvesant, Reggie du Poister turned down his thumb. Habet, he said, from the strange schemes of Randolph Mason, by Melvin Davison Post, copyright 1896, by G. P. Putnam's Sons. End of section six. Recorded by Sherry Elston, Minnesota.